Okay, looks like the pace is slacking down, so we'll go ahead and get started. Good morning. I'm Darren Morgan, Chenard's Nursery. And today's class is about moles, voles, and gophers and similar pests. And if you have other pest questions that are outside the parameters of the presentation, I'll still be happy to field them uh, at, at the end if you got anything additional you want to go over. Um, so these are significant pests um, from a plant standpoint in terms of ornamental and vegetable garden culture, and in some cases, even, even orchard crops, trees, and larger plants. Um, and that's why it's become such a, such a big topic in our industry is how can we provide adequate control of these pests in a reasonable and safe manner. Uh, that's why this is always kind of a popular class. So the first step in achieving control of these pests is definitely recognizing which burrowing pest you're actually dealing with. Um, there are a batch of burrowers here, um, and all three of the main ones here, the moles, voles, and gophers, exhibit very different behaviors, reproductive strategies, um, and require different control methods. You can't just find holes and kind of treat with randomly and assume you're going to get good control. You really do have to identify the pests. So first step we're going to cover right now is a little bit about what you're seeing um, and what you, how to recognize which kind of pests you're working with. So this is a pocket gopher um, and they do large, relatively large holes in mounds. And the thing about uh, gopher mounds and the recognition of, of a gopher mound, it's often the, they're, they're active uh, rapidly uh, day and night but you'll notice that you, they don't stay above ground long enough for that to sit still for that little picture like you see on the left very often. So you often don't get a really good look at them. So often your best determination of what pest you've got is actually the hole uh, and the mound affiliated with it. So um, on the right hand picture there is a very typical gopher mound. And the key identification to a gopher mound is gophers really splay their dirt from their diggings and excavations fairly broadly, kind of a fan shaped mound. Um, they don't just burrow up from underground and just barely push the soil up. So you'll typically have a fan-shaped or relatively low spreading mound. There will be a hole that is usually fairly visible um, and it'll be to one edge of the, of the pile. It may be somewhat obscured um, or as in the case of the picture here, there, there may be a dirt plug in it or it could be an open hole. Either, either one is common, but it's typically to one side or one edge of the fan of dirt. Um, and visible, noticeably visible um, and present. So um, gophers are large family oriented rodents. Uh, they dig fairly extensive burrow systems, both laterally in terms of moving from location to location and feeding, and also fairly deep uh, underground in terms of uh, habitation and, and, and uh, rearing their young. Um, as populations increase, they simply exponentially increase the amount of area they're living in. Um, so they go from one gopher to batches of gophers to hordes of gophers uh, pretty quickly. And, and they all tend to stay relatively within the same area rather than expanding out and covering and, 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 and exploring into new territories. Um, so gophers, because of the population density, because of the amount of damage of um, tunneling they're doing, um, are fairly significant pests. They are herbivores. Um, they do graze. They come above ground to feed on for and forage on plant materials, green plant materials. They also eat a ton of roots, tubers, and, uh, and similar plant parts. Uh, so they can be very damaging to bulbs, um, even young shrubs and orchards. Their tunneling is also damaging in and of itself, not only in terms of aesthetic value and things like a flower bed or, uh, or a lawn area, but also uh, in terms of um, moving water away from plants you're trying to water and even being something of a, of a footing risk. Uh, they, it's a pretty extensive uh, system of holes and the holes are fairly substantial. The mole is a completely different critter entirely. And again, they spend most of their lives underground where gophers come out and forage pretty regularly. Uh, moles uh, are almost entire lives spent underground digging tunnels. Um, they eat insects and worms. So they are uh, predatory in that, in that nature. So they'll be uh, delving fairly extensive horizontal networks uh, in the course of foraging for food. Um, 
Now, moles are not very family oriented. Typically, a given territory will have one mated pair and they defend that territory from other moles. Um, the typical predator behavior, you got hunting zones and that's they, they wanna keep control of, the, of their zones. Um, as young mature, they are eventually chased out of the home territory to go find their own territory. Um, the challenge to that assumption is simply that what you consider a territory, for example, your yard or your garden, depending on the available habitat might be one or more mole habitation zone. So you might have more than a single mated pair simply because you have good habitat for them. Um, so moles are one of those question begging critters in terms of control. They do damage. They, they do a fair amount of tunneling, uh, which really turns over young plants, uh, creates unsightly and again, some potential step risk or trip risk areas um, throughout flower beds and lawns. Um, on the other hand, they don't really eat that much plant material. Yes, a certain percentage of their, of their diet is roots of plants, uh, somewhere you know, 10 to 20% of their diet might be plant material roots, but they don't typically browse enough to do substantial plant damage, except in the course of simply the tunneling behavior. Um, similarly, the, the tunnels can, again, move water away from plants you're trying to water, create, creating different flow patterns and, and, and making your watering less effective. So. Moles, it's a question of can you live with them or not, where gophers are really pretty hard to tolerate uh, the, the amount of damage they're gonna do. Now, the meadow vole is our other major hole dwelling pest in the, in the Willamette Valley. And meadow voles, um, you really can't tolerate. Uh, so they're a, a vole is simply a kind of biggish short-tailed mouse, basically. Um, and they are aggressive feeders with multiple generations per year with multiple pups per generation. So the population growth rate is very, very rapid. They will dig a number of small, relatively shallow holes, you know, typically in a, in, a, in, a, in a given area, they'll develop fairly substantial networks of holes. Um, and they will use holes for a while and then abandon them and dig new ones and over the generational turnover. So you'll have a batch of holes that are being used and a batch of holes that are not being used. Vole holes, you generally do not see a dirt mound. So your gopher has your fan-shaped mound with the hole visible on the outside edge. Your mole has a volcanic or upright or rounded mound with the hole being completely concealed beneath the mound, not generally speaking visible. Your vole has a visible hole with no mound. Vole holes vary quite a bit in size, um, somewhere around an inch out to maybe two inches or so in diameter. It's really common to see uh, vole holes also have a network of runs where they've been chewing through um, plant material and, or simply running back and forth frequently enough to actually wear a, a trail uh, in, in the surrounding soils. Um, so voles eat seeds and leaves, mostly seeds, shoots and roots. So they do root damage, they eat the bark of trees and shrubs being a huge pest in, in orchards. Um, they also eat seeds and they are a, a huge problem in the, in the grass seed, the grass seed industry. Um, you get these huge uh, fields of, of grass seed and high vole populations and voles can take significant percentages of the, of the crop, 20 or 30%, even have a huge acreage of grass seed, it can be lost to voles when populations get bad. So their consumption rate is massive, the amount of things they eat is massive, and the potential for damage to, uh, to woody plants and, and bulbs is, is really substantial. Uh, so they really are a high priority control uh, pest, uh, hard to live with. So when we say those are our big burrowers here, um, there certainly are other burrowers and other holes you might see in your, in your lawn, garden, or landscape. Ground squirrel holes are typically somewhat larger uh, than, uh, than what we're looking at in vole cases, but are open hold like a vole with a, with a loose fan of dirt sp uh, spread around or often not substantially visible depending on the species of ground squirrel. Um, they are a significant uh, livestock uh, risk for, for leg breakage in the holes for some of the bigger ground squirrels. Um, ground squirrels are uh, variety feeders, but uh, tend, tending to eat a lot of um, bark 
and, and shoot tips on new growth, and then seeds, uh, for example, cones uh, of quite a wide variety of plants. Uh, there are several species of ground squirrel, so anything we say about them is a little, little general. Um, they tend to be sporadic problems. Yes, we have them in our area, um, and particularly in more rural areas, you will find typically higher populations. They typically are not the degree of problem gophers or voles are. Rats also tunnel, both in terms of habitation, also to gain uh, access. Rat tunnels will typically be affiliated with structure. You'll find tunnels working their way under a foundation of a building or to the foundation of a building, for example. Um, and uh, rats are nuisance and household pests, but don't typically do a large amount of plant damage. There are certainly exceptions to that. I have rat damage in the vegetable garden occasionally. Uh, where they're actually eating the, the fruiting crops like tomatoes and squashes right on the ground. I had one year when the rats got into the uh, sweet potatoes so bad I lost a, lost a significant portion of the, of the crop, but they're a hit and miss problem in terms of gardening. Obviously, if you have rats, your, uh, your first concern usually isn't uh, the, the gardening aspects of, the, of their pest level. Skunks are generalist predators. Um, they eat a variety of bugs, and small rodents. Uh, they can be quite beneficial animals, but they can also be hard to live with due to their, uh, their defense responses and the fact that they do dig quite a bit in terms of, uh, of hunting. Uh, they're really a bit outside of the scope of what we'd be talking about in controls today, but be aware your holes will be uh, typically shallow hunting holes uh, or very large um, nesting burrows, uh, one or the other. Uh, they, they won't typically do a lot of small holes. Raccoons are always one of my favorite ones to talk about in these classes because they do what we call a uh, mad golfer disease in the, in the lawn. Um, they're, again, uh, generalist predators with a heavy focus on eating bugs and, and grubs. And they're very good at finding these critters in a, in, a, in, a, in a lawn or turf situation and pinpointing exactly where they're at and then taking their very dexterous paws and digging up a section of turf to eat the bug, of course, they flip that turf over kind of upside down and they're not nice and they don't put it back after they're done. Um, and you'll go out in the morning after, after a foraging event of a family of raccoons and you'll have a half a dozen or more, um, looks, like, looks like golf divots where somebody took a, took a slice of turf out with their golf club and didn't, didn't tap it back in at the end. Um, raccoons are seldom worthy of try, control measures for, the, for that kind of damage. Obviously, there might be other issues in an orchard situation or with livestock where you might want to control raccoons because they're predatory behaviors. But um, typically, in, from a plant standpoint, they're not a significant pest, uh, just, a, just a, a turf situation that can be readily fixed. So those are what you're likely to see and, and, and learn to identify, even growing up here in the valley, farming, working around these critters all the time, and then in the nursery industry for the last 30 years. They fool me sometimes. I was uh, chasing a, a series of tunnels out here on the driveway aprons uh, in, our, in our planting areas. I was sure I had a mole because of the, the relatively shallow horizontal tunnels and the, uh, and the concealed, concealed holes. And while I was out there examining it and figuring out how I was going to control them, um, I had a gopher pop its head up. I swore those were mole holes, but there, it was definitely a gopher doing it. So bear with the fact that there is always some, uh, some room for doubt. And it makes it even more complicated for the fact that um, things like voles will utilize um, mole runs for transit and sometimes even abandoned gopher holes as, as habitation. So uh, it's not always an absolute one or the other. And in some cases, depending on your habitat, you may have a variety of critters doing different things in the same amount of space that you're, uh, you're, you're trying to control. So doing the best you can at identification definitely helps. Um, observation beyond just the, the actual um, you know, mound identification uh, will help narrow that down. You'll, you'll almost never see a mole above the ground. You might see the tunnels being pushed as they're moving along shallowly horizontally uh, um, underground, uh, but it's pretty unusual to actually see them up. Gophers, you'll see them popping up their heads and flicking dirt out of their mounds pretty regularly. If you, if you see a series of mounds and you, you examine it for half an hour or so, you will definitely see the activity happening um, to get a better idea on what's out there. So once you have figured out what you're dealing with, now you've got to make some decisions about control measures. Um, the number one go-to control for most pests are unfortunately toxin baits. 
you do need to be respectful of these, both in terms of your risks and in terms of their environmental impacts. None of them are perfect, but sometimes it comes down to a choice between having the plants you want um, or not having the plants you want if the pest problems are severe enough. Um, we always say the label is the law, but this is one of those things that I get just kind of incensed about. Uh, if you look at the picture on the left, your uh, your your peanut bait for for uh, for a for a, for a um, zinc phosphide um, bait says kills moles with a little tiny asterisk and gophers. It will kill moles that actually run across it incidentally. Um, it is not an attractant for moles. Moles will not seek it out uh, and eat it and get, get, get poisoned. It is, it is a chance toxin effect on moles. It is quite an effective gopher bait and one of the few baits that is substantially effective against voles. They really love peanuts. We often will, in small population areas, use traps with peanut butter because they really like peanut. Um, so these peanut-based baits, or in some cases you can get grain-based baits uh, with, with zinc phosphide, can be very effective controls for those pests, but are really poor mole controls. When you're working with uh, these, these, uh, these zinc phosphide baits, you want to get them down underground in the hole while handling and exposing yourself to them as minimally as possible. They are quite reasonably toxic. So um, don't handle them except with gloved hands. Don't open the container right at face level and inhale the dust. They are often slightly dusty. Handle them respectfully and get, uh, get a measured amount of that product down below ground, down in the tunnels where you're not gonna kill a lot of things you don't wanna kill with them. So what moles eat is worms and bugs. And there are a variety of baits that are specifically um, designed to mimic those food sources. And so if you put those down in the horizontal runs where they go back and forth in their quest for food, um, you can get pretty good control. They've got a scent that will draw the, the mole to it. Um, and they are uh, they are very, very toxic to the moles specifically. Um, they use a variety of toxins in these do treat them with respect as well. Um, handle gently um, with gloves on. Don't, uh, don't uh, do wash up thoroughly before you do anything else with your hands. Um, do get them underground to limit non-target exposure. Um, so the problem with baits, of course, is they're relatively non-selective. Anything that runs across them is likely to have some, uh, some impact. Um, most of the modern baits are less environmentally impactful than some of the old, for example, anticoagulant baits that tended to concentrate heavily up the food chain. Um, because we have a number of predators, uh, coyotes, hawks, uh, various kestrels and falcons, and particularly owls that eat heavily on rodent populations. In some cases of owls, it can be more than 90% of their, uh, pot, their food sources. So we want to you know, be careful about how much, how much toxins we're concentrating up the food chains. Anticoagulants are really bad about that. Um, zinc phosphide uh, is a good example of something that is less so simply because it gets into the system and breaks down. It uh, doesn't tend to concentrate up the food chain as badly. Um, still be respectful of them. I, I don't want to endorse wholesale use of, uh, of, of pesticides uh, where, where it's not, not beneficial. Um, the big concern we have with zinc phosphide pellets is um, that the form and the consistency of the pellet, what it's made out of, um, is also attractive to a number of birds. And this has been a problem in agricultural settings when they're trying to use these baits for rodent control in agricultural sites with um, migratory waterfowl, in particular geese and ducks. Uh, they're wa wandering through those fields on the ground, eating substantial amounts of the grains or the pellets uh, that, are, that are baited that way. So getting those below ground is definitely the key to managing the control. Um, another way to manage the control um, is to create baiting stations. This isn't practical for all critters, but um, in the case of voles, it can be very effective because one of the things that happens with voles is you'll have a network of holes that unless you're paying really close attention, you might be, not be able to tell which hole they're actively using enough right now to be effectively baited. Um, so certainly you can look for the activity marks and, and, and try to bait the most active holes, but you can also put a baiting station above ground in an area where there are multiple uh, holes or, or, uh, or runs where they're, where they're active. 
And so this is a really classic example of, a, of an easy homemade baiting system. We usually take about a two inch PVC, um, uh, uh, a T, and we'll put uh, short runs of PVC on the sides and uh, we won't even, don't even need to glue them in. There's no pressure on it. And, uh, and then, a, then a longer one up so you can have easy access. Put a non-glued cap on the top of that upright. Now you can drop your bait right down the tube. It'll accumulate down there in the T. The small diameter of the pipe limits what critters can get into it to basically rodent sized critters. Birds won't go down tunnels for food like that. Um, and so you can, it's got enough attractant with a grain or a peanut based bait to get the voles to it. Um, and so you really controlled your access to your toxin bait while still having an above ground uh, baited location. This can be very effective and this is used quite extensively in agriculture and for example, in orchard situations for vole control. So the other way to kill burrowing critters with a toxin is to smoke them out or gas them out. Um, gassers like the commercial ones you see here are actually pretty low in toxicity. Um, they are products that are generated to, designed to generate a large amount of heavier than air gas to sink down, drive the oxygen out and suffocate to death. Um, so they're not actually breathing a toxin, they're simply not breathing oxygen they need to survive. Um, this is very effective for critters with deep uh, hole systems or extensively deep hole systems, uh, which includes um, rat burrows, um, it, it includes gophers uh, predominantly is the biggest one we use it for, and ground squirrels where most of their lifespan is below ground. Gassers can work for moles in some situations. You may need to do a little more exploration in your mole situations, which I find with moles is you have li living space that's deeper down, but not super deep like a gopher. And a lot of the horizontals you see, and even the, 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 the mounds you're seeing are part of feeding tunnel networks, which are pretty shallow and gasters are not super effective at dispersing over broad areas as they are effective at going down. So you may need to do a little more chasing around in your, in your tunnel network uh, to see where you've got some deeper runs connected in and work on gassing those deeper runs rather than the shallow horizontal feeding tunnels for moles. Uh, so um, gassers can be super effective at limiting um, relatively small population bases. Um, they're not practical for voles for the obvious reason that the, the, the uh, gasser itself is bigger than the hole in many cases. Um, and because you have multiple holes, again, it's hard to decide what to treat. Uh, excellent gopher control, one of the best ways to get, to get control of gophers. So one of the more surefire ways of getting rid of moles is to trap them. It does, oh, went too far with my, there we go. Um, so it takes a, a, some practice and some skill and some hand strength and some, uh, and some bravery to work with some of these traps. Um, so mole traps are typically designed to have a trigger mechanism in the middle between two or more um, application ends where it will actually make contact with the animal because these are typically designed to be set in the horizontal feeding tunnels um, and you never know which way the mole is going back and forth in the feeding tunnel. So it needs to be able to trigger no matter which way they're going and still catch uh, the offending animal. Um, so this Victor trap you see on the left is a tr is an old, old, old design. It's very, very effective. Um, and you can make it a little bit more effective. So you have to actually dig out the, a section of the horizontal tunnel so you don't have dirt fouling the mechanism. And then you set the trap in that, uh, in that dugout section. And then you put a bucket over it, both to make sure that the moles don't see that as disturbed site and will actually continue to use it, but also to keep, again, non-target animals out from those relatively powerful jaws. Um, if you put a small cut up piece of potato or even a small clod of dirt um, in the middle of that tunnel, so if your trap is sitting here and you've got your jaws on both ends and your trigger in the middle, you put a little clod or a little chunk of, uh, of, of potato, something like that, right there underneath the trigger pan, uh, it will force them to either try to pick that up and move that along or go over it and thus make sure they're con making good contact with that trigger mechanism and triggering the trap. One of those little, little tricks. Um, these types of mole traps do take a fair amount of, um, 
of bravery and hand strength to set there. That's a very strong spring on that. Yes, they can break fingers if you're not reasonably careful with them. So read the instructions carefully and set them carefully. They do have good, modern ones have excellent safety mechanisms that you can set the trigger on the trap and they've got a little bar over the spring arm so that you can actually have it locked while you're setting the trigger and then unlock it after you've set it in the hole so it's not going off in your hands all the time. Um, but but do handle them gently. There are um, there are a batch of other mole trap designs, uh, but they all share that feature of having a centralized trigger system and then an active piece on both sides or multiple sides of that trigger so that they can get, catch them coming and going. Um, there are also unidirectional mole traps that look more like uh, gopher traps, uh, but typically you need to set more of them. So again, you dig out a big section of tunnel and you set two traps that are going one going each way in the horizontal run to ensure you're getting getting them coming and going. Um, gopher traps, uh, on the right hand picture is, is an example of a, of a small, uh, very efficient little gopher trap. Um, the, the little, the jaws parts of it are sharp uh, and you want to be careful of them, but your trigger mechanism is well back from the jaws itself. So it's relatively easy to set with a little practice. Um, the spring strength is nowhere near as, as impressively strong as those mole traps. Um, one feature that gopher traps will have in common is typically a fairly substantial distance between your trigger mechanism and your actual jaws uh, because your, your gophers are, are plugging along and kicking dirt in front of them. If your jaws are too close to your trigger mechanism, you're going to trigger without ever uh, catching the, the, the offending critter. Um, these are really lightweight little units. And if you are not fond of losing them, uh, it's a really good idea to wire them or tie them to an above ground stake outside of the hole. These can be set by either excavating out a horizontal part of a gopher run, which is again, usually a bit deeper than your horizontal mole feeding runs. Um, so dig that out and set traps both ways. If you have mounds and tunnels that they're actively working, um, it is okay to set uh, gopher traps right in the entrance tunnel, obviously you want to get it deep, down deep enough. You're not, you're, again, you're not catching non-target animals. Uh, anytime you're setting a trap like this, it's a good idea to just throw a bucket and a rock over it. Um, just again, to keep non-target animals out and to uh, reduce the disturbance feeling of the, of the tunnel network. Okay, so we talked about killing these critters often that does become the deciding factor. Um, there are some repellent uh, that are worth considering um, as, a, as, a, as a potential control. They are variably effective. Um, they are not perfect, but if, uh, if you have a strong aversion to, to killing the, the, the natural critters in your, in your landscape, um, they do provide an option, an alternative option. Um, Mole max, and there are a variety of relatively similar uh, repellents are typically granular repellents that have been impregnated with one or more substances that these animals don't like. Uh, the dominant product in use is castor oil. So they put castor oil onto a dry granule that will wash off of. Sometimes they'll also incorporate things like blood meal, uh, pepper extracts, um, all, capsaicins, all those kinds of things. But the goal here is to create an unpleasant environment that they don't want to be in. So this is not something that will you put it out in your lawn and suddenly your gopher problems go away. There's, there's a, there is a method to the application and it has a limited efficacy, but it can sometimes be enough to, to get you by with living with the critters rather than killing them. So the tricks to using a granular repellent are to figure out the active working area and evaluate where you don't want them to go from there. Then you start treating the affected area by starting um, back for areas you don't want them to move into, you treat a band from areas you don't want them to get into, into the working area, and you wait. And in a few days, they'll move away from the repellent. And if you want to move them further out, you put another band, again, focusing on areas you don't want them to get into, and then over into their working area. And you can, with layering over time, you can actually push them out. Um, these repellents are very effective against moles and pretty effective against voles, although can be challenging because as we mentioned, vole population densities are sometimes a little harder to control than, than the small population densities of moles. Um, my experience with them has not been great on gophers. They are listed for gophers and rabbits and similar critters. Um, 
I have not had great success with them with gopher control. They've done a pretty good job though with, with, with moles. Sonic repellents of, of a variety of types from as simple as those plastic windmills on, on a wire stake that, that rattle in the wind uh, all the way up to sophisticated um, solar powered uh, ultrasonic uh, spike repellents do work to a limited degree over a limited amount of space. Uh, and that limited amount of space is not is not tiny. The big problem I've had with sonic repellents is uh, that animals, if it's, if it's constantly out there, animals tend to get used to the background level of noise and they may be repelled for a while and then be less repelled over time. Um, these types of repellents are again, very effective against moles somewhat less so against gophers, generally pretty effective against voles and other mice. Uh, there are all kinds of similar technologies in use for household use, ultrasonics and stuff. What they've had in common in, in, in various testing situations is that unless they're adjustable, animals get used to the threshold of background noise and, and the repellent effect goes down and declines. Um, other deterrent effects are worth mentioning. So um, one, we talked about trying to control the toxicity of, of baits because of so many critters are predatory upon these. Um, it's worth encouraging predation versus killing off rodents, let it, letting nature take, it, take care of itself to a degree. Um, so you can decrease, though not completely eliminate uh, pest populations by encouraging particularly raptors. Um, so if you look at some of the blueberry fields around town, you'll see they have raptor perches. They have tall poles with, uh, with natural branch structures, large natural branch structures mounted on top of them. So this is to encourage uh, raptors that are perch hunters that sit and watch for activity and then swoop down and catch a rodent uh, to sit up there and, and watch that space uh, and, and to provide good predation. Uh, more practical on the homeowner level often enough is to make sure you're maintaining the space. So uh, one of the big issues we run into with, uh, with voles is um, the amount of bark damage they do in orchards. And if we can reduce the amount of cover they have getting to those, in other words, keep clear spaces around the trunks of the, of the grapes or the, or the orchard trees or the blueberries, uh, so they don't have a lot of cover to craw crawl through before getting up to those trunks, again, the predation will increase. A question in chat about rabbit control. Well, rabbits are hitting this problem when, they're, when their populations are bad, they are a significant pest. They go through burrowing stages uh, as, as well, their burrowing habitation as well. Um, typically, you don't see a huge networks of holes and burrows, so it's a bit harder to treat, at least in our area. It, it, can, be, it can be quite variable in other locations. Um, it's harder to find and treat a warren like that or a rabbit habitation like that uh, because it may not be on your property at all. They may be covering a fair amount of ground away from their actual warren space. Um, rabbits do not respond well to below ground baits because they're doing their foraging above ground um, and they are uh, not very, uh, very amenable to small traps. You can live trap rabbits. Uh, rabbits are, are very general uh, greens and, and, and shoot feeders, as well as uh, a number of other products, but greens and shoots are, can be a effective bait in a, in a live trap. And once you have them caught in a live trap, you can try to relocate them or you can humanely dispose of them. Um, for my money, live trapping is the, is the best response to rabbits short of, uh, of controlled hunting them um, because uh, they, they, can be a, they can be a problem when populations get high. In our immediate area here in the valley, it's not really been a big problem. I don't get a lot of a lot of queries about it. Uh, a bit north up the valley where I grew up, it was a bit more of a concern, but we were definitely a more rural uh, area, and uh, and the rabbits in the garden were a fairly significant pest. Um, they do have a have a fairly substantial reproductive rate. There's a, there's a reason they are such a such a symbol for for reproduction, um, and so getting some control of them is definitely beneficial before they get uh, get too out of hand. Um, diameter PVC for baiting station for voles. A lot of the books recommend a two inch diameter. That's bigger than you really need, but it will also draw in some rats and some other, other rodents, including some of the ground squirrels. Um, anything really much over an inch is probably big enough, but inch and a half to two inches is the standard. Um, 
so we talked we're talking about um, also uh, deterring pests so we talked about controlling the the space around fruit trees and grapes and kiwis to reduce um, to reduce the damage. Now, clear, clearing the space around your trees and blueberries makes them less susceptible to rodent damage because the rodents can't get in without being seen by predators. Um, so that's a that's a valid approach. Uh, moles, deterrence of moles uh, has to do with deterring your insect and grub populations in the soil. This is a, a weighted topic because we don't really want to kill off worms in the soil and they eat worms. Um, but what you'll find is they tend to concentrate their foraging behavior on areas that have relatively loose soils with relatively high insect and worm populations. This is why there's such a problem in the vegetable garden in the flower bed. Um, you can reduce um, a certain amount of, of, of uh, mole burrowing through water irrigation control. It's not an absolute though. But if you're watering your lawn all the time to keep it bright and green all summer long, you're more likely to have mole problems than if you dormant your lawn down in the summer or substantially reduce your watering so there's less insect pressure and uh, and less um, tillable or loose soil. So that's what I had for you this morning on, on general pe uh, pest control of burrowing pests. Um, I would welcome any more questions you have. Or if anybody would like to unmute and ask questions verbally, that's that's fine too at this point. If you mix gravel in uh, with um, your bark mulch or any other mulch, will that help reduce voles? Oh, right. right, so deterrence of voles from tunneling. Um, you would think that rock would deter them from going on into a, into a bark landscape. It doesn't. Look at your, uh, your highway ditches. Um, if you go, go along your roads and you look at all the, the, even in the footings of the road where there's a lot of cobble, the voles still find spaces uh, to, to, to get in there and, uh, and tunnel in. So it's not a very efficient deterrent, uh, unfortunately. Voles really are, for my money, the big concern out here. Yes, gophers can be a problem. Moles are a, are a hit and miss problem at best, uh, but voles are really hard to get good control and they are really hard to deter effectively. Uh, if I had the uh, perfect uh, the perfect um, such solution, I would be a very rich man. They spend millions and millions of dollars on bowl control agriculturally. It, it's a huge problem. It's, it's no no simple answers, unfortunately. Um, questions in chat: Do mouse traps at bowl openings work? They absolutely do. If you got an active work uh, working tunnel, you can put a mouse trap at the entrance. If you have horizontal runs, they'll be above ground runs. Those little trails out, and you can put traps crosswise in those. Uh, if you're going if you're going with mouse traps, I generally recommend you again do some sort of, of damage control to restrict the access to the trap if you're going above ground at all with the traps to just limit who's potentially getting caught in them. And if you if you're baiting right in the entrance or you're baiting right in the run, you don't necessarily even need to bait the trap. Just the incidental contact of them running back and forth so frequently is likely to trigger the trap. Um, if you want to bait, again, a little dab of peanut butter goes a long way for baiting those. The problem with mouse trapping voles is the reproductive rate. Um, you have to catch an awful lot of voles to even put a dent in the population growth rate. Uh, they reproduce really fast. So that's the big challenge with the mouse trap controls. But yes, they do work. Yes, we've used them for that. Um, what's a good way to rep repair vole tunnel damage with lots of holes and tunnels? Um, there's no perfect solutions here. Putting a sandy loam in to fill up the holes uh, is probably the easiest approach um, after stepping down so that you're collapsing any looser, um, looser shallow tunnels that you can get into. Um, they, it's not going to stop them from digging back into it. Unfortunately, very little will, but uh, it will at least shear up the, uh, uh, the, the surface so you don't have uh, just a hold, a hole filled surface anymore. Um, you can, and I would recommend when you're doing that, you use something that has a substantial amount of mineral. So that's why I recommend a sandy loam or a similar product. If you stuff it full of potting soil or you stuff it full of a lighter soil blend that has lots of organic mass, that organic mass is gonna decompose fairly in fairly short order, even just over a season, and you'll start seeing that sink back down. So having a good amount of sandy loam or other mineral soil into that does a good job of retaining that fill. Is no-dig gardening more apt to encourage vole activity? Um, 
broadly speaking, yes, simply because um, when you're tilling an area, you are tilling up runs and tunnels. New, you have no vol, essentially no vole population in the immediate area after immediate, immediately after tilling. They have to come back in, re-tunnel. You have a chance to catch on to them uh, and, and get them back under control. Um, there are a variety of things about uh, about vole behaviors that that are, are that way. One of the one of the things is voles are actually in some cases more of a problem in raised beds than they are in in native soils because you've got this nice little transition zone between your between your hard surface of your beds and your soil masses, providing them neat little spots to get a hold and start tunneling in easily. Um, so raised beds, um, if you underlay them. When you're making them so that they can't come in from underneath, that reduces the damage, but it doesn't completely control it. Some of the worst problems I've seen with voles have been in things like um, stacked rock walls and similar raised structures where there's a lot of surface area on a horizontal that can get in and, and burrow in. Um, so ad addressing those kind of situations. Uh, weed barrier fabrics and similar plastic covers are not a sufficient deterrent. They will tunnel under them and they will cut right through them where they want to come in and out. Um, so it needs to be pretty, uh, pretty heavy duty. We use um, hardware cloth, same stuff they use for uh, window screening is, is very effective. Most chicken wire has way too big a gap. They can go through fairly small holes, so uh, it can be a little bit hard to exclude them. Uh, question, do I get a lot of calls for mole, vole, and gopher problems in city pro properties, or is this more suburban rural problems? So um, they're a problem everywhere. Um, with that's why the mole, vole, and gopher part is what we really focus on because raccoons, less so rabbits, less so definitely more more uh, rural property situations. But moles, voles, and gophers occur throughout our area and can be as bad a problem in urban environments as they are in rural rural situations. Um, that being said, uh, you know I'm out in northeast Corvallis. I'm on a wetland soil base. I have very few burrowing rodents. Why? because my winter water table is at the soil surface and most critters cannot live there year round. Um, so <laughs> there, there's, there's definitely some, some trade-offs there, but in those real wetlands, um, you, can have, you can have some rodent populations, but they're really limited because if, they re if, those, if those areas really flood out because they can't live there over the winter in those flooded soil situations. Um, Voles, I would say, are more, I see more as a, as a rural problem in general, but um, that's not exclusive. And I've seen plenty of them even in downtown type situations in, in Corvallis. We have, we have a lot of them around. All right. Well, if nobody has any further questions for me, I'll let you go to enjoy your uh, rainy Sunday. I wish it was as like yesterday, but unfortunately, we are in spring in the Pacific Northwest, so we get what we get. Thank you very much for attending. I appreciate it. Thank you.